Welcome to the unit Weaving Techniques. This unit introduces skills needed for weaving. Students will learn weaving techniques through a combination of textual content, drawings and video demonstrations. This unit comprises of three modules and a final review section that invites you to reflect on what you have learned. By the end of this unit, students will be able to identify the materials and tools required for weaving, describe basic weaves and describe weaving techniques. The first module will give you an overview of the development of weaving and the different materials and tools used in weaving. Weaving is one of the most primitive methods of fabric construction. In its simplest form, weaving is done by the interlacement of two distinct and separate sets of threads perpendicular to each other. The longitudinal threads are called the warp and the lateral threads are the weft or filling. Weft or woof is an old English word meaning that which is woven. It is likely that ancient people might have realized the possibilities of the woven structure after observing spiders webs birds' nests and the construction of a beaver's dam. These findings probably led to the interlacing of twigs or vines and resulted in netting which surely assisted humans in catching fish and trapping game. Eventually, people used weaving skills to make exterior coverings for shelters to protect them from harsh weather and from predators. Archaeologists believe that basket making and weaving were probably the first crafts developed by humans. Once primitive people learned ways of creating a woven structure, the possibilities were endless. Netting, coverings for huts, containers for goods, carriers for the young, rugs, blankets, hammocks, pouches and body coverings. The actual origin of weaving is obscure. However, ancient Greek, Egyptian records and Indus Valley excavations bear evidence of the art and craft of weaving in these ancient civilizations. The weaving loom is a frame which is used to hold the vertical set of threads namely warp, taut and parallel while the weft is inserted backwards and forwards between the warp threads. There are three important types of looms, the backstrap loom, the horizontal loom and the treadle loom. The simplest looms are the backstrap or body tension looms. Early weaving was also done on vertical looms with a warp suspended from an upper bar weighted at the bottom. Another type of loom is a horizontal loom which has been the most highly developed in course of human history. The most commonly used looms for hand weaving is the treadle loom which has remained unchanged from its earliest models. Despite its early origins, the principle of hand weaving remains unchanged even with the introduction of power looms and auxiliary machinery in this craft. Weaving involves three basic operations, shedding, picking, and beating. Shedding can be described as a lifting of warp threads to form a shed. A triangular space between the warp threads that are lifted up and those that remain down. Picking is the next operation which involves the passing of the weft threads through the shed. The weft may be wound onto a shuttle to speed the process of weaving. Finally, beating involves the even packing of the weft threads with a comb-like structure or reed. These are the tools and materials used in weaving. This module will examine various basic weaves and weaving techniques. Cloth is usually woven on a loom, a device that holds the warp threads in place while filling threads are woven through them. A fabric that meets this definition of cloth can also be made using other methods 
including tablet weaving, backstrap or other techniques without looms. The way the warp and filling threads interlace with each other is called the weave. The majority of woven products are created with one of the three basic weaves, plain weave, satin weave or twill weave. Plain weave, also called tabby weave or taffeta weave, is the most basic of three fundamental types of textile weaves. It is the simplest, common and inexpensive type of construction to produce which has a durable, flat and a tight surface. It is conductive to printing and other finishes. Balanced plain weaves are fabrics in which the warp and wefts are made of threads of the same weight and can be identified by its checkerboard-like appearance. It is also known as one up one down weave or over and under pattern. Each weft yarn goes alternately over and under one warp yarn. Some examples of plain weave fabrics are crepe, taffeta, organdy, organza and muslin. The plain weave may also have variations like the following. Rib effect is produced by using coarser yarns in the filling direction or by more warp than filling yarns per inch. Some examples of rib weave fabric are bengaline, ottoman, fail, poplin, broadcloth and taffeta. Basket weave is constructed by treating two or more yarns in the warp or weft or both the directions and interlacing them in plain weave. It is not as balanced as plain weave and has more yarn slippage and shrinks easily. Some examples are Oxford cloth, monk's cloth, flat duck, hop sack and panama. Twill weaves are the weaves that find a wide range of applications. They can be constructed in a variety of ways and have many variations. The main feature of this weave structure are pronounced diagonal parallel lines that run along the width of the fabric and distinguish it from other types of weaves. In a twill weave, each weft or filling yarn floats across the warp yarns in a progression of interlacings to the right or left, forming a distinct diagonal line. This diagonal line is also known as a whale. A float is a portion of a yarn that crosses over two or more yarns from the opposite direction. Twill weave can be identified by its diagonal lines. This is 2 by 2 twill with two warp threads crossing every two weft threads. A twill weave is the second most basic weave that can be made on a fairly simple loom. Twill weave is often designated as a fraction such as 2 by 2 in which the numerator indicates the number of threads that are raised as given in the example and the denominator indicates the number of threads that are lowered when a filling yarn is inserted. The fraction 2 by 2 would be read as 2 up, 2 down. These are some examples of variations of twill weave. Right hand twill. In this twill, the diagonals run upwards to the right. Left hand twill. In this twill, the diagonals run upwards to the left. In the balanced twill, the same number of warp passes over filling yarns. It is reversible like 2x2 two two or 4x4. Four four. The unbalanced twill has an uneven number of warp or filling yarn. It has a right or wrong side. The denim broken twill combines right or left hand twills. In the herringbone twill, a series of inverted V's are formed resembling the backbone of the herringbone fish. These are commonly used in suiting fabrics. Twill angles are according to the angles of the diagonal line. Regular twill has 45 degree angle. Reclining twill has smaller angles. Steep twill has larger angles. 
Examples of this twill are denim, herringbone and hound's tooth. Other twills are zigzag, pointed or wavy twills. Twills are also described as warp and weft faced twills. I'm going to be demonstrating a basic or tabby weave. A basic or tabby weave is made with an over under over under process. I'm using a three inch tapestry needle and I'm going to go under one string over one string under one over one under one over one till I can't go anymore. Then I'll grab the tip of my needle and pull it through a little. Then I'll go over, under, over, under, over, under, over, under, and pull it through a little. And you'll do that all the way across the loom until you get to the other side. Being careful not to go over two or under two. Once you get across the other side, you'll pull your yarn until the end of your yarn comes up to the first string on the side where you started. Do not tie a knot. Just push the yarn down as far as it'll go. Now on the far side I, my yarn is underneath the warp string. The second row has to be opposite the first row. So now I'll do the opposite. Instead of going back under I'll go over. Over, under, over, under, over as far as I can go pull it through a little, 
I'm already under that string, so I'll go over the next one. Under, over, under, over, under, over. Sometimes it helps to look at the previous row. If the previous row the yarn is under that warp string, then you know you have to go over. So you're going to go, be going under every warp string that was over on the previous row. When you get all the way across again, you'll pull your yarn and when you have a loop over here, you'll pull it just till the loop touches that first warp string on that side. Just barely touching it. Pull your yarn down to make a mountain. Push the mountain down. If you end up with a loop on this side, just pull your yarn until the loop comes up to the first string. Now I'm over the first string on this side, so I'll do the opposite when I go back. I'll go under. That way you, you're going completely around the end warp string and creating a nice smooth selvage or edge to your weaving. Try not to go over two or under two. If you do, you'll mess up your pattern. And again, we have a loop over here, so we'll pull it until the yarn just touches that string, pulling it down on the other side to make that mountain, and then push your yarn down. Notice that the string only shows on top of each individual row. If you make a mistake and go over two or under two, which I'm doing right here, I'm going over two, then your pattern will be compromised and it'll end up being the same as the row before it. And you'll see that now the warp string is going to show, when I push this down, the warp string is going to show on top of two rows at a time. These two rows are exactly the same now because I changed my pattern when I went over to. I went back to my previous row pattern. And when you have two the same like that and the string shows on top, you've made a boo-boo. Then you have to take it out. So to take it out, you simply weave back the same way you came and it comes right out. A good weaver recognizes their mistakes quickly and takes them out. Every weaver makes mistakes, but a good weaver recognizes them quickly. It takes a while to recognize your mistakes, so don't get frustrated. And don't try to watch TV while you're learning to weave. Even advanced weavers can't watch TV. We can only listen because we're watching our needle to make sure we're not messing up our pattern. Now I've corrected that mistake and as I push the yarn down the string doesn't show at all within my weaving. So continue to weave until you've completed your first piece of yarn. And once you've completed your first piece of yarn, you untie the needle and you'll begin a second piece of yarn. And that will be lesson number two. So please join me for lesson number two. In traditional tapestry weaving, the warp threads are completely covered by the weft. The weft is the yarn woven across the loom, over and under the warp threads, shown in the lower half of this picture. Before warping the loom, we need to determine the warp set. This is the number of warp ends per inch, known as the EPI. It determines the spacing between each warp thread and how intricate you can make your weaving. The warp set is related to the weft yarn you plan to use and is important to ensure your weaving has an even surface. A simple method for determining the appropriate warp set 
is to wind both the warp and the weft around a ruler for one inch as I will demonstrate now. Here we are using a non-stretched cotton as the warp, the white thread and a DK weight wool yarn as the weft, the green thread. I have marked out one inch on the back of the weaving sword which comes with the weaving kit. Then take both ends together and line them up along one of the lines and tape the two ends to the back of the weaving sword with some sticky tape to hold them in place. Then gently wind the yarns together around the weaving sword as shown here, making sure that you do not pull too tightly on the wool yarn and that you do not bunch the yarns together too much. Wind until you reach the other mark, then count the number of white threads. In this case there are nine. We are going to round that number down to an even number of eight so that our warp set for this weaving will be eight ends per inch. Next we're going to mark out one inch units on the rounded ends of the weaving frame. Use a tape measure and pencil to do this at both ends as shown here. We are now ready to start warping our loom. Place the ball of warping thread on the floor and the loom on a table. Attach the warping thread to the round end with a simple knot. Then holding the warp firmly between your fingers, rotate the whole loom and wind the warp around the opposite round end. Continue rotating the loom and winding the warp. Wind so that there are four warp ends to each inch marked at either end. When we secure the warp in the next step, the warp ends will double to give you the eight warp ends per inch which are required for the set. You may find it more comfortable to rest the loom on your lap to warp the loom. Choose whichever technique you find most comfortable. Next, we're going to give each thread a little pull to make sure that all the warp threads are evenly tensioned, but not too tight. Tie off the end in the same way we tied on at the beginning. We are now going to secure and space the warp with a couple of rows of weaving. This will be done with the same warp thread. Measure out three widths of the loom with the warp thread. And using the wool needle provided in the kit, thread the warp onto the needle. Next, we are going to weave one row by going over the warp threads that are on top and behind the warp threads that are sitting below, as shown here. Be careful to alternate going over and under each thread in order so that they do not twist. Check as you go along by pulling the warp thread downwards. Once you reach the right edge, pull the thread through, leaving about 15 centimeters at the other end. Next, grab a fork from the kitchen and firmly pack the yarn down. Now we are going to wind the thread around the right side of the loom two times. Once and then twice. And then thread the needle again. And this time we are going to weave back the other way going under the opposite warp threads. This will be easier as the warp threads will already be up and you will be able to go under several threads at a time. Once you're at the other end, pack down the thread with your fork again and wind the ends of the yarn around the left side of the loom and tie firmly with a knot. These two rows of weaving will help secure your warp in place. Now we need to adjust the spacing so that the correct set is established from the beginning. We use a tape measure to do this and either your fingers or the end of the wool needle 
Adjust the threads so that there are 8 warp ends per inch. The final step before we start our weaving is to insert the shed stick, also known as a weaving sword. Starting from the left edge of the warp, we're going to insert the shed stick between each warp thread alternately so that the warp leaning towards the back sits on top of the shed stick and the one leaning towards the front sits behind the shed stick. Work your way across the whole width of the warp. Swiveling this shed stick upwards will push every alternate warp thread either to the back or the front, creating what is known as an open shed. If you want to learn the basic plain weaving stitch, please watch my plain weaving video. In order to better understand basic fabric design and construction, we must look at the components of a woven fabric. Warp yarns are fed into weaving in a direction parallel to the selvages of the fabric. The filling yarns are inserted perpendicular to the warp. The edge of the fabric has a selvage and with some insertion methods there is a fringe. The fringe is created by the ends of the filling yarn projecting from the edge of the fabric and can be tucked back into the cloth with a tucking unit. The plain weave is the oldest, simplest, and most often used woven structure. It repeats on the minimum of two ends and two picks. This area is a single repeat of a plain weave. One can easily see that adjacent warp yarns weave in opposition to each other. When one end is up, the adjacent ends are down. After the filling is inserted, the warp yarns switch positions. The cross-sectional view shows the up and down movement of the warp yarn. Notice the blue and green warp yarns are moving in opposite direction to each other. Woven patterns are most often depicted on graph paper. The graph indicates how one would depict a plain weave. When the warp yarn is shaded black, the warp end is up and the filling is down. When the warp end is up, this is referred to as a riser or float. When the warp end is down, this is referred to as a sinker and is depicted by a white square in the woven pattern. Plain weave fabrics have the highest number of interlacings of any weave. The result of this dense weaving is a relatively low tearing strength, higher tensile strength, lower snagging, tendency to ravel less, and tendency to wrinkle more. The basket weave is a derivative of the plain weave. The most common of baskets is the 2x2 two two basket. The repeat area is 4 ends by 4 picks. All ends weave in pairs as do the picks. The illustration shows a 2x2 two two weave, which gives a distinct checkerboard effect. In basket weaves, if both warp and filling risers are equal, then the weave is considered to be a regular or balanced weave. Other regular basket weaves are 3x3 three three and 4x4. Four four. All basket weaves are not regular. For example, a 3x2 or a 3x2x1x1 three by by one by one, or a 3x1. The Oxford weave is also a plain weave derivative. In this weave, two warp ends weave as one, while each filling yarn weaves alone. In most cases, the warp yarns are half the size of the filling yarns. Let's take a look at a twill fabric. Twill fabrics are characterized by diagonal lines on the face of the cloth formed by the floating or rising of warp yarns over the filling yarns. The twill line is determined by the direction of the diagonal. If the twill line moves from the lower left to the upper right, the twill is a right-hand twill. This weave is also called a Z-twill. If the line moves in the opposite direction, it is a left-hand twill and is sometimes called an S-twill. The angle of the twill is the result of the ratio of warp ends to filling picks. 
The comparative sizes of the warp and filling yarns will also affect the angle of the twill. Twill lines can be anywhere between 15 and 75 degrees. A 45 degree twill angle is considered a normal twill angle and anything higher is considered a steep twill and lower angles a reclining twill. Twill weaves are designated by what is known as a counter. The counter of a twill designates the order of weaving of the first end of the repeat. The example shown is the simplest of twills, the two by one. It repeats on three ends and three picks. The opposite of a two by one twill is the one by two twill. The two by one twill is a warp faced twill and the one by two is a filling faced twill. These are the same fabric, just opposite sides. In twills, the first number represents the number of warp risers on the first warp end of the repeat. The second number is the number of warp sinkers, following the risers on the same warp end. The graph represents a two by one right hand twill. Find the first warp yarn and follow the path of this yarn. It's obvious that there are two warp risers followed by one warp sinker per repeat. Follow the second warp yarn and you can see that the warp sinker is first, followed by two warp risers. The final warp yarn in the repeat has a warp riser, a warp sinker, and another warp riser. The pattern is repeated in both the vertical and horizontal directions. This graph represents a 3 by one right-hand twill. As in the 2 by one twill, find the first warp yarn and follow the path of this warp yarn. There are three warp risers followed by one warp sinker per repeat. Follow the second warp yarn and you will see that the warp sinker is first followed by three warp risers. The third warp yarn has a warp riser, then a warp sinker, then two more warp risers. The final warp yarn in the repeat has two warp risers, a warp sinker, and another warp riser. The pattern is repeated in both the vertical and horizontal directions and repeats on four ends and four picks. As shown, the twill may have a right hand or left hand angle to the twill line. The appearance of the twill line can be accentuated or diminished by the direction of yarn twist. Yarn twist direction corresponds to the angle the fibers are twisted to form the yarn. By looking at the fibers in the center of the yarn illustration, one can see that if the letter Z is superimposed on top of the yarn, and the twist direction of the fibers matches the center of the letter Z, this yarn is said to have a Z twist. If the letter S matches the direction of yarn twist, then the yarn is said to have an S twist. The table shows the effect of matching the different twill directions with the yarn twist direction. The effect will be a more or less pronounced twill line. For instance, a right hand twill and Z twist gives the fabric twill line a low ridge or soft twill. A left hand twill and Z twist will give a higher ridge on the twill. In addition, the loom backrest or whip roll setting can affect the height of a twill as well. A low backrest will give a softer or lower height, while a high backrest will give a pronounced or higher twill ridge. The graph shows that a 2x2 two two twill repeats on four ends and four picks. Each warp yarn rises over two picks and then sinks under two picks. The 2x2 two two twill is a balanced twill. A simple herringbone or pointed twill can be made by reversing the 2x2 two two twill from a right hand twill to a left hand twill. The graph now shows a herringbone twill. Warp ends number 1 through 4 weave as right hand. On warp end 5, the twill reverses the harnesses so that risers become sinkers and warp ends 6 through 8 step in a left hand twill direction. Notice that where the twill line reverses, the adjacent ends are in opposing positions of riser and sinker. Herringbone weaves are broken twill weaves composed of alternating left and right hand twills to produce the herringbone pattern. This can be accomplished on a dobby loom using a straight draw or by using a herringbone draw on a cam loom to produce the same effect. The chevron is a 2x2 two two twill that is right hand on ends 1 through 4 and the weave reverses to a left hand twill on ends 5 through 8. Notice that ends 4 and 5 form a point at the reversal.
Fabrics woven with the satin weave have a soft, smooth, and lustrous face without any appearance of pattern formation. The number of interlacings between warp and filling yarns is reduced to a minimum. The terms satin and sateen are often confused. Satin is a weave, and sateen is a satin weave constructed with yarns other than silk. Satin weaves are designated by the number of harnesses that are required to weave them. The harnesses are sometimes referred to as shafts. Each end in the repeat weaves differently. Therefore, the number of ends per repeat will be the same as the number of harnesses required to weave the fabric. Satin may be made using as few as five harnesses and have been made using as many as sixteen. The five harness satin is the most common. In the five harness warp satin, warp yarn one sinks under pick one and rises over the next four picks. This pattern repeats vertically on the same warp yarn. The second warp yarn rises over the first two picks, sinks under pick three, and rises over picks number four and five. It's easy to see that the sinker or binder moves up two picks instead of one as with a twill. Satin counters must never touch. If they do, then the weave is some type of twill. In subsequent warp yarns three, four, and five, the sinker moves up two picks. This movement of the binder pick is referred to as a counter. Therefore, this satin has a two counter. The pattern repeat is five ends and five picks. This five harness satin has a three counter. Notice that warp yarn two moves up three picks for the binder. The only possible counters for a five harness satin are two and three. Counters one and four will not work because if the counter is either a one or four, then the weave will be a twill. With the eight harness satin weave, a three or five counter is possible. With a three counter, the first warp end sinks for one pick and rises for the next seven picks. The next warp end moves up three picks for the sinker. The subsequent warp ends three, four, five, six, seven, and eight follow the same pattern. If a five counter is used, then on the first end the first pick is a sinker followed by seven floating picks. The next warp end moves up five picks for the sinker. The subsequent warp ends three, four, five, six, seven, and eight follow the same pattern of moving five picks before weaving the sinker into the fabric. The crepe weave is also a derivative of the plain weave. The most common crepes are cam weaves and are typically made with high twist warp and filling yarns. The twist may range from a 5.0 twist multiple or higher. The fabric may also use alternating S and Z twist yarn to accentuate the crepe effect. After weaving and during finishing, the fabric relaxes and the high twist makes the fabric surface become pebbly in an appearance that is called crepe. It should be noted that this fabric can be difficult to weave on air jet looms due to the tendency of the high twist filling yarns to kink. The Bedford cord is a weave characterized by cord lines that run warp-wise in the cloth. The weave between the cords is usually plain weave. However, the weave of the cord can be plain or twill. There are several filling or weft floats on the back of the fabric, causing the yarns to bunch and form the cords in the cloth. A stuffer yarn can be used when the cord effect needs to be more pronounced. The PK is a weave characterized by cords that run widthwise or in the filling direction. The fabric requires at least three harnesses and repeats over the needed number of ends to create the desired width of the whale. As can be seen, the Bedford cord has cords in the warp direction, and PK has cords in the weft direction. Corduroy is a pile fabric. The pile or cords of the corduroy fabric is always formed with the filling yarn. The cords or whales may number from 1 to 22 per inch of fabric. Corduroy can be made with one warp and one or two fillings. When two types of filling are used, the fabric is called ground pick corduroy. Corduroy can be made as single binder or double binder. Double binder is when two ends are weaving as one in the warp. Corduroy can also have a V-shaped pile, a W-shaped pile, or a combination of both. 
The choice of binder and pile shape affects the cost and performance of the fabric. The V-pile is the simplest to cut, but once cut, the pile has a higher tendency to come out of the fabric. The W-pile, due to its multiple interlacings with the ground warp, is less likely to be pulled out from the fabric during use and care. Some corduroy has a combination of both V and W. Usually seen in wide whale goods, the W will add to the stability of the outside of the whale, and the V will give each whale good height in the middle. The result can be a very pronounced whale. After the fabric comes off the loom, the pile picks must be cut. A specially shaped guide needle is inserted in the fabric above the ground ends and picks, but below the pile picks. A rotary knife is inserted in the slot of the needle and is lowered so that it will cut the pile picks but not the ground fabric. In wide whale corduroy, each whale is cut during a single pass, but with fine whale corduroy, it is necessary to cut half the cords during a first pass. On the second pass through the knives, the remaining uncut cords are cut. Normally, every other whale is cut on the first pass, and the remaining whales are cut on the second pass. All whales cannot be cut at the same time due to the limitations of the cutting machine. This extra pass through the knives adds considerably to the cost of the finished fabric, as well as the chance of creating seconds. Velvet is a pile fabric that can be made from two or more ground and pile warps. The pile is created by the warp. The pile can be V-shaped, W-shaped, or a combination of both. Most velvet fabrics are woven as two fabrics, and they are separated at the loom or during a separate operation off the loom. Velvet pile is less than one-eighth of an inch in height. Pile heights over one-eighth of an inch are referred to as plush fabrics. Velveteen is a pile fabric formed by the filling. The pile of velveteen fabric is shorter than the pile of velvet. Very little velveteen is woven today due to the extremely high number of picks per inch, which can be as high as 400. Fabrics with extremely complicated woven designs are manufactured using a jacquard loom. In jacquard weaving, each individual warp end can be controlled instead of a series or groups of warp ends as in harness looms. This separate yarn control provides the greatest freedom for the designer because large intricate patterns can be transferred to fabric. Jacquard designs will involve at least two of the basic weaves, such as satin weave or plain weave, in various arrangements to form patterns. Satin and sateen, both terms refer to fabric names and weave structures. Satin is a weave that typically has a glossy surface and a dull back. This weave is characterized by four or more fill or weft yarns floating over a warp yarn or vice versa, that is four warp yarns floating over a single weft yarn. Floats are mist interlacings where the warp yarn lies on top of the weft in a warp face satin and where the weft yarn lies on top of the warp yarns in weft face satins. Unlike in other weaves, the floats explain the even sheen and the reflection of light from the surface. Satin is usually a warp-faced weaving technique in which warp yarns are floated over weft yarns, although there are weft face satins also known as sateen. Each warp or filling yarn floats over four filling or warp yarns and interlaces with fifth filling warp yarn with progression of interlacings by two to the right or left. Satin weaves are based on intervals of interlacement for their construction of four end satin, five end satin, seven end satin, eight end satin to 22 end satin. The interlacing float over three, four or more than four yarns before a single interlacing and are denoted by 4x1, by 7x1, one, one, or 11x1, one, etc. A satin fabric tends to have a high luster due to the high number of floats on the fabric. Due to this, satin is commonly used in apparel. Satin baseball jackets, athletic shorts, women's lingerie, nightgowns, blouses, evening gowns, also in men's boxers shorts, briefs, shirts, 
and neckties. It is also used in the production of pointed shoes for use in ballet. Other uses include interior furnishing fabrics, upholstery and bed sheets. In this module, you will learn about different weaving techniques. There are two important weaving techniques, card weaving and frame weaving technique. We will look at each of these in detail. Card weaving can be done on square, rectangular or circular cards. Any size or type of card which is strong and thick enough to take the tension of threads without bending can be used. The board needs to be prepared before beginning to weave. The method for preparing the cards for weaving is to wind warp threads across both sides of the card or on a single side of the card. The requirements for card weaving are a strong piece of cardboard or plywood, a needle shuttle to carry the weft yarns, yarns, ribbons or any other threads, scissors or a cutter and a ruler. These are the card weaving steps. First, cut a piece of cardboard to required size and mark and cut evenly spaced slits at top and bottom. Next, fasten warp yarn at the back of the card with adhesive tape and pass through first slit. Carry the yarn up across the card, bringing it through the opposite slit, then warp it around the back of the card and bring, bring up through second slit. Repeat the step fastening warp yarn at back with adhesive tape. The warp threads can also be wrapped around the tongues formed by the slits instead of around the back of the card. To do this, follow the steps. Take the yarn up through the first slit, wrap it around the tongue of the card and back through the second slit. Continue until one side of card is covered with threads. The back of the card will show short horizontal threads behind alternate tongues. While weaving on cards, the warp threads are attached to the card and the weft threads are then woven into them from either right or left or left to right. Using a weaving needle and starting from either right or left, darn the weft threads under and over the warp threads. Using the blunt end of the needle, push the threads together to ensure that they are right. After completing the woven fabric, the piece is removed from the card and the loose strands are woven back into the fabric for finishing by pushing them back with the help of the needle. If the weft thread were coarse or thick, it would be preferable to introduce a new weft from the opposite side to the one where the previous weft had ended. If the thread is thinner, then the new weft could be inserted from the same side, leaving about 3 4 of an inch of both the old and new weft yarns at the edge of the card, tuck loose strands of the old weft over next pick to ensure to secure them. Weaving the weft threads too tightly across would cause the warp threads to pull toward the center and the edges inwards. The insertion of the weft may be done continuously in order as the weave repeat.
So I decided the easiest way for you to learn how to weave would just be to create your own cardboard loom. So what you're going to need is a rectangular piece of cardboard, a ruler, scissors, two colors of yarn, and something to write with. Hi! Okay, so once you have all of your materials for um, this weaving project, the first thing you're going to want to do is take your rectangle of cardboard, your ruler, and your thing to write with, and you're just going to measure um, along the width of your cardboard. Sorry, it's bright here. Um, just measure one centimeter apart and make a little mark at each centimeter and do it on the other side as well. Just take your scissors and make a little cut wherever you put your mark. So in the end it's going to look like these little teeth. Once you have your little slats cut, you're going to measure out a piece of yarn. I'd say like maybe five arm's lengths or something, maybe four. And then cut your yarn off. So I just measured like four arms widths worth of yarn. And then you're going to take it and tie a knot at one end. You can tie it a few times to make sure the knot is nice and big. Okay. Once you've tied your knot, you're going to insert the piece of thread with the knot in the back right through this first little slot that you made and pull your thread so that um, the knot catches on the back. Um, so you bring your yarn down and you put it through the corresponding slot on the bottom of your loom and then you take it around and you loop it over the next one and you bring it back to the top and then you loop it around back, bring it to the bottom, loop it around back, bring it to the top, loop it around, bring it down. Okay, once you've reached the end of your loom and you've got to the last one, you can just kind of leave it hanging off. I'm gonna cut the extra off here. Um, it should be pretty secure. Now we are ready to start weaving. So take the other color of thread, or yarn rather, and just measure out like the same that you did before, just four arms widths of yarn. Once you have your other color of yarn measured out, now we're going to start the fun part. Um, so, weaving is very simple. This is just like the basic weaving, basic weave. Um, so you're going to start out by going over your first thread, and then under your next, and then over, and then under. And you just keep going over and under your threads until you reach the end. Okay, once you've reached the end, you just kind of push your yarn down to the bottom. And then you're going to take from the long end again 
and go around on the other side. So now we're going to do the opposite of what we just did. So our first round we went over the first one, now we need to go under. And this is important because this is what locks in your yarn on the side to make your fabric. So we went under and then we go over and then we go under and then we go over and then under. So you can see we're doing the opposite of what we did on the first round and you do this all the way to the end. And once you get to the end on this round, you're going to pull your thread all the way through. And once you get towards the end, you can pull it, but don't pull it too tight. You can leave it kind of loose there and push it down to meet your first thread. Now we're going to go back and do that again from the side that we ended on. So we ended with an over and now we start with an under. Over, under. And then you do this all the way to the end. So you probably understand um, how this is going to work from here on out. Um, you're just going to keep doing this over under pattern until you've built up a piece of fabric. So I've reached the end, so now I'm pulling all the way through. Push it down. Super easy. I'm going to keep working on mine so that I can just show you what it's um, going to look like in the end. Okay, so I just kept weaving on this piece of cardboard and putting in some other color here just to break it up a little bit, but this is it. Um, by just doing that simple technique, you created your own fabric. So if you decide that you like weaving and you want to get a larger loom, you can buy one online or you can make your own. I made this loom with just four different size dowel rods that I got from a craft store and I just put them together with these little thingies that you nail in and then I spaced out these nails to put my warp threads on. So really easy construction of just a basic wooden frame and this is a weaving I'm working on on this right now. Followed by card weaving, one of the next simplest form of weaving is frame weaving. During frame weaving, the warp yarns are wound onto nails at each end of the frame and the weft is woven with a shuttle. A wide range of fabrics can be woven with frame such as plain or tabby weaving and tapestry weaving. However, the length and width of the woven fabric is dependent upon the size of the frame. The requirements for frame weaving are a strong piece of wooden frame, a shuttle stick to carry the weft yarns, a shed stick, nails, yarns, ribbons or any other threads, scissors or cutter and a ruler. This band displays the weaving techniques. Before starting to weave, the warp must be prepared. This is achieved by wrapping the yarn around the inner rows of nails. The outer row of the nails would be used into if a finer warp were required. First, fasten the first yarn by securely tying one end of warp yarn to the first nail. Next, wrap the warp yarn around the opposite nail from left to right. Pass the yarn around the second nail at the bottom from left to right. Continue along the width of the frame. 
it is very important that the tension on the warp must be even throughout the warp. Fasten the yarn to the last nail at the bottom. Finally, the shed stick needs to be woven by passing it alternately over and under one pair of warp threads. This is the prepared warp on the frame. The insertion of weft may be done continuously in the order as the weave repeat. These are the steps for the weaving process. To begin weaving, turn the shed stick on its side and insert the shuttle from any one side leaving about 2 to 3 inches of the yarn loose on the side of the warp. Flatten the shed stick back to its original position and use it to push the inserted weft to the front of the frame. Before the insertion of the next weft, tuck the loose strand of the weft over next pick to secure it. Insert the next weft or pick by darning the shuttle in and out through the alternate warp ends. Push the inserted second weft into place with the help of shed stick. Continue weaving in the same manner by repeating steps 1 to 3. The insertion of the weft may be done continuously in the order as the weave repeat. For finishing of the woven fabric, the woven piece is first removed from the frame by either unhooking it or by cutting the warp yarn at each end. Each loose yarn or thread is then woven into the fabric with the help of a darning needle by pushing the needle into the fabric and drawing the yarn with it. This would hide the loose strands in the fabric. A new color can be introduced during the course of weaving at any point by adding a new weft in the second shuttle stick. Care must be taken to interlock those loose strands at the edges. This would ensure neat edges and an effortless weaving process. To summarize, in this unit you have learned the technique of weaving. In particular, you have learned about the materials and tools used in weaving and seen examples of, of weaving techniques. Thank you.